So here we are, ready to go. Thanks everyone for tuning in tonight. Welcome to Tune In Tuesday, September 15th, 2020. The one baptism of original Christianity. It's a new teaching series, so fasten your seatbelts, everybody, and hold on to your hats, because among all the doctrines of Christendom, few are more inflammatory than the topic of baptism. Genocide has been committed in its name. Arguments have raged over the method for water baptism, whether immersion or not, or whether it should be done to infants or not, etc. Or with the baptism in the Spirit, if that term referred only to a single event at Pentecost, at the beginning of the church, or if it occurs throughout the church age. I will attempt to douse those flames with verse and reason, Bible verse that is, but also I will attempt to make peace. Why should we Christians be fighting about something like this? We ought to be fighting the devil and not each other. But first, our task is is to discover what the original Christians believed concerning this topic. In order to do that, we all will have to do something honest, but difficult. Something many think they may have already done, but may not really have. And this is even more essential now because of how fraught with contention this topic has been. This topic, like any other biblical subject, has to be handled dispassionately, logically, scripturally. Therefore, we must, we must, we must set aside the traditions and the doctrines of men and rely solely on scripture. We've got to build it from the ground up brick by brick and truth by truth. Why? (laughs) Should we honor tradition? Well, I prefer the source. Because are we afraid of what we might find? (laughs) Are we afraid we might need to change? Well, are we not human? (laughs) Have we not the potential to be wrong? Surely. And surely, although people have believed something for so long, it does make it right. Because how long did the world believe the earth was flat? (laughs) It's been longer than they haven't. And surely, too, although many may believe something, that doesn't make it right either. Remember, (laughs) our mommies taught us that. But we also surely have the potential to change if we're found to have made mistakes and, and not compound that fault with rebellion by refusing to change. And if convicted of error. So... If you don't want to be called Shirley, <laughs> you'll consider what I say. Look, we all know what happened to the Jews because they lost their first faith. They lost their kingdom and their land and their temple and even more. How could that have happened to them, of all people, after the miraculous deliverance of the Red Sea? It's very clear from the reproof of the prophets of old that the Jews did not keep the original law of Moses but added doctrines of men to it. I mean, let's listen to what the prophets said about that. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 9. Isaiah says, Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers and the seers hath he covered. And the vision of all that has become unto you, as the words of a book that is sealed, which been delivered to one that's learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people 
draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear, their reverence toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous and incredible work among this people, even a marvelous, incredible work, and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Ooh, <laughs> that's pretty dire, isn't it? Well, who are this people? Would you want to be one of them? Look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Judah, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain? Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of draught, through the shadow of death, through the land that no man passed through, where no man dwelt? And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. And the priests said not, where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. And the pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked not after the things that do not profit. Wherefore I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. For pass over the isles of Kittim and see and send to Kadar. That's like saying from the west to the east. Look everywhere. And consider diligently. And see if there be such a thing. Hath a nation changed their gods? Which are yet no gods. But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. I'll be astonished, ye heavens, at this. And be horribly afraid. And be desolate, thus, Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. I mean, the pagans didn't even dare do that to change their gods. But God's people did. <laughs> No pagan nation had ever changed their gods, yet the true God's people had changed. Would you want to be one of, quote-unquote, God's people back then and have this laid at your feet? Without question, it was because their priests and their pastors and their prophets had been deceived and in turn misled the people. Well, it happened to God's people back then. So, it could happen again, right? Well, did it happen to Christendom? Look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Put your burnt offerings under your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I spake not to your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this thing I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. 
Since the day your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day have I sent unto you all my servants the prophets daily, rising up early and sending them. Yet they hearkened not to me, nor inclined their ear, but hardened their neck, and they did worse than their fathers. So, by the time of John the Baptist, the Jews had lost their kingdom and their land and their freedom and their religion had become a shadow of its former self and the champions of men's doctrines the Sadducees and Pharisees were in firm control in this class we will see that the reformer John the Baptist instituted water baptism as a right to signal believers return to Moses and rejection of Phariseeism, legalism, and the traditions of men. Have men today made water baptism into the opposite of what it was originally intended? Jesus also reproved the Pharisees for altering their faith. Look at Matthew 15. Matthew 15. Verse 1, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said to them, Well, why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curses father or mother, let him die the death. But you, you Pharisees, say, Whosoever shall say to this father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mindest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. See, they had the word that's in here. It is a gift. I think that's the word Corban. They had a, uh, set up something that you could make a payment to the temple and then you could get off the hook for this if the payment was large enough. And so you didn't have to honor your father or mother, you'd be free. And so he said, thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Jesus said to them, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you saying, this people draws nigh unto me with their mouth and honors me with their lips but their hearts far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. See, the Pharisees neutralized one of the Ten Commandments with their man-made doctrine. Well, would you want to be one of God's people back then? Yet, many Christians today will insist that we've stayed faithful to the faith. They maintain that they've adhered to the traditions of old. But I say, which faith? The Orthodox Christian faith or the original Christian faith? Let's listen to what Jude says. Jude chapter 1 verse 3. He said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write in you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So, if Jude, in the late first century, was begging and adjuring and imploring them to earnestly contend for the faith, then, well, where does that put the orthodoxy that was cobbled together a few centuries later? Had the same effects which compromised Judaism after Moses affected Christendom? After Jesus and the Apostles, they both had the same adversary. Are men's ideas about God right? Well, there definitely is a spiritual realm. There's whispers of it everywhere. But who's most accurate? Men's conceptions formed from blindly reaching up into the unknown? Or words of God, who does see and know, reaching down to us men and women? Let's listen to what Paul said. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 23. Paul said, For as I passed by, he was in Athens, 
and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you, <laughs> God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things. Well, is Christendom ignorantly worshipping too? Well, you know, if you think about it, you know, we're the finite trying to comprehend the infinite. Well, if you think of it that way, well then, yes. <laughs> By that very definition, there has to be at least some ignorance on our part. <laughs> well, how much is the real question? Consequently, can a spiritual God be worshipped with man's hands? And it doesn't mean how we hold our hands when we pray. Just think, how can a spiritual God benefit from anything we men do here in the physical realm? See, hands, figuratively, are put for works. Remember, Jesus said, if your hand offends you, cut it off. Well, that, that's a Semitic idiom. They understood that as, if what you're doing is getting you in trouble, stop doing it. <laughs> the same is true if your eye offends you. That's about what you're thinking. Or if your foot offends you, that's about where you're going. Well, if it's getting you in trouble, stop. <laughs> Worshiping God by men's hands is what traditions are all about. And we've seen so far, uh, men's traditions have a tendency to get us in the soup. All right? Are we, are we supposed to worship in a certain place, on a certain day, in a certain way, because everybody else has done it for centuries? Is that a still a requirement after Christ came? Well, let's listen to what Jesus has to say. Look at John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 21. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship you know not what. We know what we worship for salvations of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is eminent when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, that fits with Acts, what we read from Paul. I mean, it's pretty clear that the new worship that Jesus was about to bring into effect was in spirit. Ah, if you don't like that, why don't you take it up with him? I'm just the messenger. <laughs> the new worship was to be spiritual. He even says right there that the impending form of worship would not be at Jerusalem with the temple and all that regalia. Why? Well, buildings and rituals and acts and works and tradition and the like are worshiping in temples made with men's hands and worshiping by means of men's hands. Do you see that all of that would be moot? Where does that put the traditions observed within those buildings? For answers, we must look to what Jesus was building toward, to what he accomplished and what he brought into effect. Well, what was that? It was original Christianity. So actually, to really reveal the truth, I have to ask, when Jesus was here upon earth, was he a Christian or a Jew? <laughs> That's a provocative question, isn't it? But I dare ask it and I dare answer it, that when Jesus was here teaching upon earth, what he taught certainly was the pinnacle of Judaism. He said he was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel right? Well, he was their Messiah, wasn't he? So that was the zenith of Judaism. 
But the Jews rejected him and crucified him. And consequently, and thankfully too, his doctrines became the seed of Christianity. But what came of that was not Orthodox Christianity. Because so-called Orthodoxy came into being because original Semitic Christianity was hijacked by Greek philosophy. The religion that emerged from the mists of history in the 4th century was far different than the original. What happened on the day of Pentecost was original. Therefore, we must search for original Christianity, like Jude implored. We need to earnestly contend for it. Consequently, when the dust clears, some of us may be confronted with the option of changing our beliefs. Well, do you want to remain orthodox or become original <laughs> it'll be your free choice so where did the original christians get their beliefs well they got them from three sources the first place is from the old testament there are many prophecies of the coming messiah which came to pass in the gospels in this category especially the bible is rich with prophecy and symbolism and fulfillment. The second place they got their beliefs was from the teachings of Jesus when he was here upon earth. His main objective then was to accomplish our redemption and salvation. And boy, there's a whole lot of information to draw from there too. And finally, the third place they got their beliefs was from the teachings of the apostles after Pentecost. Now, it's regarding this third source that I must bring out an important point. A lot was fulfilled when our Lord died for us and was raised from among the dead and ascended to God's right hand. So a lot changed on the day of Pentecost. Isn't it so that with fulfillment comes change? Well, how much changed? In my other classes on these seven ones of original Christianity, we've seen that uh, so much change at Pentecost, it caused wind. <laughs> so actually, we must add a fourth criteria for our belief in this class. And we can do that because we've covered over half of the ones by this time. So I ask, shouldn't the results, the truths that we learn, regarding the one baptism of original Christianity fit with the truths that we've already discovered by our study of one God and one Lord and one spirit and one body? Absolutely. One common characteristic of all the rest of the ones was that on the day of Pentecost, it was a moment of great change. It was a crossroads, a great turning point, a new beginning. Might it also be a time of fulfilling change involving this topic of baptism? Therefore, whatever we find regarding one baptism ought to fit with God's plan of redemption that was taught in the One Lord series. Also, whatever we find regarding one baptism ought to fit with dispensationalism that we proved in the One Body class. Dispensationalism maintains that there have been and will be distinct ages in which the ground rules regarding man's relationship with God change from age to age. The central tenet of dispensationalism is the great mystery. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8 declares that if Satan and his princes had known the great mystery, they would not have crucified Jesus Christ. Therefore, the great mystery erects an impenetrable barrier that no one, and I mean no one, could have known it before the day of Pentecost. So what does that bring into the equation? It supports that the day of Pentecost was a day of sea change. And that change permeated many things, even baptism. But, you know, <laughs> humans don't like change, <laughs> especially religious ones. <laughs> Consequently, it took a while for the apostles to realize what had changed and to properly manage it. The book of Acts 
records this. It's a time of transition. The apostles had to carry the church safely through that process to fully embrace what had been established in its place on the day of Pentecost. But some doggedly have held on to the old and don't want to embrace anything new. The book of Acts records the doctrinal transition during which the apostles learned what changed and what stayed the same. And they also reported on those who responded to that change by only upgrading part way and on those who embraced all that had changed. Similarly today, there are churches stretched out all along Redemption Road, frozen into the different stages of that very same transition. Well, are we to mow them down and force our conclusions upon them? Heavens, no! That would cause destruction. There are brothers, and believers would get hurt, especially those who were in their infancy, and God won't stand for that. I mean, it is a real eye-opener that the seven types of churches given in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, although they radically differed, yet the Lord had something to say to each of them. So he hadn't forsaken any of them. He still functions within them, within all the different types of churches. So, would it be a good idea to thwart him by imposing our findings on the ones that don't agree with us? Hmm, (laughs) I don't think so. They all get people born again. Well, hallelujah. We're brothers. So, we are going to teach what we know in this class and make the information freely available to folks to consider but there will be no condemning or attacking, all right, those who hold a different opinion. The Pentecost upgrade was extensive because our redemption was that profound. And so, if we teach it right, with the right attitude, I think we all can benefit from this teaching. I mean, with one God, God did not change, but our status and approach to him did on the day of Pentecost. With one Lord, a lot changed with Jesus. He became the head of the body with a new assignment because redemption had been accomplished. With one spirit, whoa, a big spiritual upgrade occurred and many spiritual things were reshuffled in spiritual matters. With one body, wow, that was totally unknown, something totally new. It's part of the great mystery that was revealed. With one hope, all coming end time events now were inevitable. And with one faith, a new religion for both Jew and Gentile happened. And on the day of Pentecost, Christianity was born. So do you think there might have been a change regarding baptism too? But before I answer that, (laughs) I have to ask another question. What is a ritual like baptism doing in this list of cardinal doctrines? Look at it. The other ones in this list involve hugely important topics like who God is or who Jesus our Lord is or what the Holy Spirit in believers is, or how the one body works, or our great hope for Christ's return and the momentous events of the end times, or the one faith which started in the original true church. Those are all grand topics. So I ask, how could a ritual, baptism, something done with men's hands, belong in such a lofty list? There's got to be an answer to that. Consequently, of all the seven ones, initially, the one baptism may seem to be something less major. But that can't be so, because it's in this list of the cardinal doctrines. 
the category headings under which all Christian doctrine is organized. Furthermore, due to baptism's association with Holy Spirit, one might think that some of what could be under the baptism and Holy Spirit topic ought to be shared with the one spirit topic. And that that would limit or diminish the one baptism category even more. So again, how could this be a cardinal doctrine? Cardinal, that means a category head. There's got to be more to it. But how could we authoritatively discern that and not it be merely a matter of one man's opinion over another? Unless, of course, that one man was an apostle. (laughs) My answer came when I remembered that the lists of the sevens in Ephesians 4, verse 4 through 6, another seven in Hebrews 6, verse 1 and 2, another seven in 1 Timothy 3, 16, and the seven, I would not that you were ignorant, passages, all of those line up. They all line up. See, this is using the biblical hermeneutic principle of concurrence. Hermeneutic is in study of interpretation. Many of the churches frozen in their positions along Redemption Road are basing their stance on their interpretation of one verse rather than looking at all the verses on the topic. However, when we compare these seven lists together, the whole picture concerning the profound depth of each category emerges. Because we don't want to be one verse Charlie's. And this insight involves us in a grander scope, and it shows us an overall theme, and it gives us the big picture. And such observations like this are authoritative and incontrovertible. This consensus of Scripture is the rock-solid bedrock of genuine, original Christianity. You know what it's like? It's like saying, let's ask the apostles. So, the first list, Ephesians 4, verse 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Okay? So it says one baptism. That's all it says about this category right now. Next list is Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 6. See, this is why original Christianity was not primitive. It was mature. Things like lists take a lot of time and thought. These are summaries. It wasn't that the apostles didn't know what they had and it took the Greek philosophers of the 4th and 3rd and 4th centuries to explain the depths of the word? No. <laughs> the apostles knew what they were talking about. I mean, the, the miracles prove that. So, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, leaving the principles of, number one, the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of, number two, repentance from dead works and of number three faith toward God of the number four doctrine of baptisms and of the number five laying on of hands and of number six resurrection of the dead and number seven eternal judgment so there in that list our topic is doctrine of baptisms plural Hmm, okay. Next one. First Timothy chapter three verse sixteen. First Timothy chapter three verse sixteen. <clears throat> it says, And without controversy, great is number one, the mystery of godliness. Then the word God is is a forgery. It should be which the text prove that, which was, number two, manifest in the flesh, number three, justified in the spirit, 
Number four, seen of angels. Number five, preached unto the Gentiles. Number six, believed on in the world. And number seven, received up into glory. Now, where is the topic regarding baptism in this list? Well, <laughs> if you work from process of elimination, plus you do phrase studies, by process of el elimination, believed on in the world is what is in this category of the one baptism. Wow. Wow. Okay, that adds more insight. See, each of these category heads actually is a synecdoche. It is a figure of speech apart for the whole. It's a cardinal. See, these cardinals are summaries. It's the one for the whole. But this one, this one, this this one on baptism is more figurative than the rest. All right? The last list of sevens is where we're really going to see the depth of this. The last list of sevens is the seven not ignorant ofs. <laughs> All right? And we're going to really see the fullness of the one baptism category here. And it's very figurative in nature. And that's going to bring in a lot of symbolism that's throughout the Bible. Because it is a rich and abundant amount of material to draw from. So, of course, I, of course, from my hermeneutic method, I'm apt to portray the literal side of all that teaching. So, believed on in the world, that's salvation and the plan of salvation. But, because there is such a rich amount of figurative beauty pent up in this topic that begs to be burst forth, we have to give the figurative time on the main stage there as well. And that's why I've teamed up with Mel Elliott because of his insights into the figurative language of the Bible. So as I said, there are seven not ignorant ofs that are scattered throughout Paul's epistles. And the one that pertains to this category of one baptism is given in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. I'm just going to read through the list, and then later in another session, Mel's going to tell us more about it. But it is here in 1 Corinthians 10 that we see the true breadth of this doctrine of one baptism. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Moreover, brethren... I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses and in the cloud and in the sea. There it says baptized. It does that interesting. It fits right with this category. And all did eat the same spiritual meat and all did drink the same spiritual drink. For they all drank of that spiritual rock that followed him and that rock was Christ. Look at all the symbolism here. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be you idolaters, as were some of them, as is written. The people sat down to eat and rose up to play. <laughs> well, that play was not play like we think. Ah. Verse 8, neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Verse 9, neither let us tempt the Lord, is what the text is, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these happened, these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world will come. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands on his own take heed lest he fall without this example. We need that example to help us. Verse 13, because there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able, 
but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Wherefore, practical application, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. So, do you see how when we superimpose each of the references in the baptism category over each other, when we superimpose them like that, it gives us a better comprehension of the entire subject. Isn't it fascinating that this not ignorant of actually has baptism there in that term, baptized in the sea? And it it brings in all the symbolism from the Old Testament right here. So you heard it said, the Old Testament is New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So, you know, (laughs) this class is not going to be just us asserting what we believe regarding what the Bible says about the rite of baptism, and then us provoking (laughs) the rest of Christendom. (laughs) No, no. We're going to explore the rich depths of the truths in this grand subject together. Because these figurative insights are based on type and anti-type relationships between the Old and the New Testament. And this is called typology. And it's going to carry us through a grand tour of eternity beginning with the Genesis 1 blueprint for the cosmos, the witness of the stars, our redemption and glory written in the heavens. It also includes the red thread throughout every book of the Bible, each portraying the Messiah in a different light, and the messianic prophecy pictures in the tabernacle and temple. Wow. All of this is under this category heading. And it illustrates the spirituality of the Bible that it indeed is God-breathed and his fingerprints are all over it. So this topic of baptism is not a minor topic at all. The one baptism and all of its rich symbolism focuses on the entire subject of evangelism and salvation, which just happens to be job number one of the church. Now, can you see (laughs) how this ranks as a cardinal doctrine of equal stature with the rest? It's not just merely a right. Salvation is the major project of the church. We all have the ministry of reconciliation. And we all, all of us Christians, and all Christian churches are in this together. We're partners in this endeavor. And I think it's time we act like it. (laughs) So let's take a break, and then we'll be getting into part two in a few minutes. So bless you.